All right, so good afternoon again, students. We are going to begin our look at language variation today. Now, language variation has several different areas, and we will begin this unit. It's going to take us about three weeks, two to three weeks to cover. All right, so we are beginning this initial aspect of it. Of course, we're gonna be looking at speech communities and communities of practice as well, which these form the basis of language variation. And if you remember last week or the week before last class, I was saying that language variation is the hallmark of social linguistics. All right, so without language variation, we really wouldn't have much to study. Right, because we would all be speaking the same way, right? There wouldn't be anything interesting really after we analyze what we speak, then that would be it because we're all speaking the same way. But of course, with language variation, we have quite a number of different areas of languages to look at. First of all, different languages to study, right? Different speakers, different mannerisms, different levels of communicative competence, etc. So definitely, you know, with language variation, it, it actually makes languages come alive because we have quite a bit of variety to study, all right? And not only that, but if we, and let us look at the individual level now, if we all were speaking the same way, right, all the time, then again, we wouldn't really have anything interesting to, to study, all right? But because there is a variation as it relates to the speech of individuals and the, the speech of groups, of course, we have quite a bit to look at, all right? So I want us to watch this clip and then we're gonna have a discussion all right some of you might recognize the voice perhaps Janice not sure if you if you're familiar with this past student who is now lecturing in Canada all right so he created a little video that we are going to watch and then we will have a little discussion about it all right, but before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit more about the speech community. All right, so with the speech community, one of the things that we, we automatically, you know, begin to think is that the speech community comprises of individuals who live within the same community. And that is how the term was of, of, um, initially proposed, right, that we live in the same community, we interact a lot with each other, we have the same communicative norms, right? So remember our initial discussion about serve when you go to the, the, the corner shop, right? And so within a speech community, there are certain norms, norms of interaction and norms of interpretation that would apply and the members of such a speech community would share these norms. Now, if you have an outsider, then you will have miscommunication taking place if it is that they don't understand, you know, the communicative norms because they can be outside of the speech community, but they have been exposed to some of the norms. So they're able to maneuver effectively in the space. But if they've not been previously exposed, then, you know, obviously you, you will have some miscommunication taking place. So, for instance, the, and we look a little bit at him as well, the DJ that is called Gentleman. Are you guys familiar with him? That's the white one? Yes. Yes, right. Yes, right. And he's from where again? Um... Somewhere in Europe. Somewhere in Europe. Yeah, yes. there. Germany. Wonderful. Germany, it's Germany, Germany. Right. Germany. And his communicative competence in Jamaican Creole 
even before he came to Jamaica. I mean, his ability to, to, to express himself using Jamaican Creole, you know, is really excellent. I remember an interview and hopefully we'll, we'll get an opportunity to look at it. I remember an interview that he did with Anthony Miller, right? For, I think it's, it's entertainment report. And that was his first time in Jamaica. But by that time, he was quite fluent in Patois, right? So the, the question, you know, that we want to also look at is, do we have to really be within the community physically to be a part of, to be considered a part of a speech community? Because if you, if you didn't see him before and you hear him, you would think that he's Jamaican, right? Because you, you, you hear the pronunciation, you hear the, the lyrics in his songs, etc. It is Patois. Right. And so we want to look at that as well, the speech community in the global village, right? Because the world is getting smaller because of technology and the internet, right? Social media networks and so on. So do we really have to live in the same community or even in the same country to be considered a part of the speech community? So, for instance, Jamaicans abroad, do we consider them to be a part of the speech community? All right. So let us look at this video and then we'll have a discussion. So sometimes you will get lecture notes. Sometimes we'll have a discussion because with the discussion, you know, you're able to explore the topic some more, you know, hear from each other and to have a better understanding. So we have a variety of ways of conducting our sessions here all right so i'm expecting that you guys will definitely participate you know as you have, you have been doing so let us go into it uh, let me share so and just confirm that you're hearing whether you know it or not you belong to a speech community there's a good chance that you belong to several different speech communities too. Unlike a community where people live that uses geographical markers to define its borders, a speech community uses linguistic markers to outline its borders. Even if you are a monolingual speaker of English or another language, by virtue of being a university student, you are now a part of a speech community which is separate from other speech communities that you might be a part of, either because you're Canadian or you play a particular sport or you belong to an age demographic. All of these are speech communities which have their linguistic markers and some of these linguistic markers overlap, which means the speech communities overlap as well. Think of a specific student. Let's call her Achike. Achike is a 25 year old and she was born in Canada to Nigerian immigrant parents. So she is a second generation Canadian Nigerian. At present, a little over 17% of the entire Canadian population falls into this category, where at least one parent was born outside Canada. Let's say Achike works in IT and she's completing a business degree at university and her languages are Igbo, her vernacular language learned from her parents, English, she's fully bilingual in this language, and French, she is a beginning learner of French. All of these languages, including any variation on these languages that Achike might use throughout her life, comprise her idiolect. As Achike goes about her day, she moves between different groups of persons. With family and close friends, her language use is split 80-20 between Igbo and English. At work, the reverse is true. Her language use is split 95-5% to between English and Igbo. And in her French conversation club, the split is 60 to 40 between French and English, respectively. All of these groups that Achike is a part of 
are different speech communities and whenever she uses a different language inside one of these speech communities it is called code switching she may decide to code switch to facilitate communication between members of her speech community it might be a requirement that she uses a specific language in certain contexts and it could happen unconsciously we could say that Achike is a multilingual individual that code switches between three different languages across a variety of speech communities. This is her social network. Each person in her various social networks also has their own idiolect. And whenever we group all these idiolects together, what we have is called a sociolect at the macrolinguistic level. Researchers who study the impact of language on the individual are called sociolinguists, while those who study the impact of language on society belong to a discipline called the sociology of language. Both of these areas are related in very important ways. Since it is not possible to separate macrolinguistic attitudes towards language from their origin at the microlinguistic level, sociolinguist Max Weinrich once said, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. What he meant here was that the difference between a language and a dialect, at least the way that these terms are used normally, isn't a scientific or a linguistic difference, but it is a sociopolitical one. The word language is used for forms of speech which have power and prestige, or the army and navy while dialect is used for forms of speech which lack this prestige. But this distinction has no basis in linguistics. All languages are dialects, which means none is more intrinsically prestigious than another. Any prestige that a language has accrued is a purely socially constructed form of prestige, which can change with time and circumstances. To avoid these loaded social terms, linguists often use the neutral phrase speech variety when investigating different speech styles across speech communities. Nonetheless, these social constructs can have far-reaching impacts on the individual and the wider society, as we shall go on to see later. feedback your thoughts on the video anything that was said so there would have been some new information as well as some things that we already discussed all right so it's a nice little video for our purposes right we so i identified that the speaker said that it's well it, what was inferred that you can belong to more than one speech communities so it's not limited to one so someone can exist in more than one speech communities and within with that context say for instance the the character achibe or Chike, <laughs> she belonged to more than one speech communities and to function if she's coming out of one specific um, speech community she would use the technique of code switching to facilitate the next or the other um, speech language or, or communication in a certain or a specific speech community so that's the technique used to facilitate effective communication she would code switch to that technique. And um, within that speech community, also, she there is also something called a social network based on the various persons she would interact with in that speech community. Oh, yeah. That's what I received. Well, there is more, but that's just my point. Right, so there's a lot, you know, that's that's good. That's a, a good little review of, you know, the video. 
So we are going to be looking at the social network theory and what we mean by a social network. So you guys belong to different social networks. You belong to your network at your, your workplace, in your community, with your friends, with your hobbies. If you know you have some some other some other job that you're doing, you know, if you freelance in a particular area, for instance. So all the different domains in which you interact with others, right? We call them networks. And when we look further at networks, we will look at how the networks may overlap and how that might influence your speech. So let's say your neighbor is also a colleague at work. So you would be interacting more with that individual than with others. And so this theory says that, you know, you and your neighbor will more than likely speak alike or share communicative norms more than others because you two are interacting in more spaces. And let's say, you know, you are that same neighbor who is also your coworker. You guys play tennis together or football together. That's another network, right? And then let's say you have five more individuals that share those same networks, right? So you would have a multiplex, a dense multiplex network. And with a dense multiplex network, it says that you're going to sound like the individuals within your networks, right? So that is something that we'll be looking at. So we're not going to go too deeply into it now, but you can begin to think about some of the, those groups that you belong to. Right, because I even want us to touch on the community of practice. Because with the community of practice, this now is a counter to this is a counter to the speech community, right? Because the, the, the flaw with the speech community is that it implies that we're in the same physical community together. And for some individuals, right they don't even know what their neighbor look like they don't even know the neighbor's name right so in those cases how can you say that they have shared communicative norms right coming to your makini right so how can you say that they have shared communicative norms so penelope eckert came up with the term community of practice to say listen it is really about people coming together around a common goal that really influences similarity in speech. So for instance, the football club, right? That's a speech community. You guys would practice regularly, right? Together uh, on the weekends and let's say after work, after school, etc. And so you're spending a lot of time together with those individuals and so you because you're interacting with them more than you're interacting with your neighbors or even your family right this community of practice might be what is influencing your speech all right so we have the speech community versus the community of practice so that is something that i want you guys to think about you know as we, we move on to explore these things yes makini go ahead uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was wondering if it if it's possible for a person to leave a speech community. So say, for instance, you have a certain job, you use a certain language in that job, you leave that job. Um, are you always a part of a speech community once you, you once you start? Or is it a case where I, I'm finished with that, I can leave this speech community, if that makes sense? Right, so remember that language and identity are intertwined. So you can't just get up one day and say, oh, you know, I'm gonna leave a speech community. What will happen is that over time, your speech might be influenced 
by new the new surroundings. So let's say you migrate, you would have to make a conscious decision not to use Jamaican Creole, right? So if you are interacting a lot with persons outside of the Jamaican speech community, then over time, of course, you know, your speech will change. But people make a conscious effort to do that. It's not automatic that once you leave a physical space, you are no longer a part of the speech community. But one of the requirements is that you are interacting regularly with members of the speech community, whether on the phone, on the internet, etc. But you have to be interacting regular, regularly with them. So regular interaction is a requirement for membership in a speech community, right? But then again, if you if you migrate, you may not be interacting regularly with members of your, your previous speech community. But when you do interact with them, you you still have the shared norms. You're still using Patois. You're still using Jamaican English. You still sound like a Jamaican. Right, so no one makes that uh, conscious decision that they're gonna leave a speech community. However, gradually, you know that can happen, right? And um, I remember even just this week sharing with uh, with a friend, you know, even this week sharing with a friend, and she was sharing that you know she's she's friends with a particular doctor. You know, so she's in the medical field and she's friends she's friends with a particular doctor who he he left Jamaica when he was like ten, you know, so preteen years. And you know, while interacting with him, he was using Jamaican Creole. So he would have left the speech community years ago. He's in his forties now. You know, and he has been living and working in America. However, he's still using Jamaican Creole when interacting with another Jamaican, right? So as you know, you heard it in the video, you can actually belong to more than one speech community. And even if you leave that physical space, you can still remain a member as long as you're interacting with the individuals in the speech community and you're using your your language and language that represents that speech community and with that language as i said before we have shared communicative norms all right so let me know if that answers your question thank you okay great anything else that you might want to share based on the video anyone uh let me just check the chat okay all right so i'm just gonna replay it and then we move on Okay. Whether you know it or not, you belong to a speech community. And there's a good chance that you belong to several different speech communities too. Unlike a community where people live that uses geographical markers to define its borders, a speech community uses linguistic markers to outline its borders. Even if you are a monolingual speaker of English or another language, by virtue of being a university student, you are now a part of a speech community which is separate from other speech communities that you might be a part of, either because you are Canadian or you play a particular sport or you belong to an age demographic. All of these are speech communities which have their linguistic markers 
and some of these linguistic markers overlap, which means the speech communities overlap as well. Think of a specific student. Let's call her Achike. Achike is a 25-year-old and she was born in Canada to Nigerian immigrant parents. So she is a second generation Canadian Nigerian. At present, a little over 17% of the entire Canadian population falls into this category, where at least one parent was born outside Canada. Let's say Achike works in IT and she is completing a business degree at university. And her languages are Igbo, her vernacular language learned from her parents, English, she is fully bilingual in this language, and French, she is a beginning learner of French. All of these languages, including any variation on these languages that Achike might use throughout her life, comprise her idiolect. As Achike goes about her day, she moves between different groups. All right, so just to comment on the idiolect, an idiolect is an individual's own unique way of speaking. So with the idiolect, it has to do with your quality of voice, your pitch. When you hear a particular entertainer, for instance, or actor or actress, you know, or DJ, you, you're able to say, this is bounty killer or you're able to say that this is Chris Tucker, right? This is John Brown, et cetera, because they have their own unique way of speaking. So that is the idiolect. And the idiolect is not only restricted to speech, but also writing. So when, when, when I'm teaching undergrad, I always tell the students that your idiolect is also represented on paper. So if when I'm marking a paper and I'm reading something that don't sound like you, <laughs> I, I automatically know that that's not your work, right? Because the idiolect is also reflected in your, your writing because it has to do with language use in general and speech being an aspect of that. Right, and then from the idiolect, we talk about the echolect, and an echolect is the collection of similar idiolects within a household. So, you know, I'm sure you guys might have been told that you sound like your mom, or for the men, you sound like your dad, or you sound like your brother, etc. etc. And I always tell the joke, you know, when my, my brother was dating his wife you know um he, he, her sister you know she called the house to speak to my brother because they were very good friends and she called the house and my dad answered the phone and i don't know what was happening she was calling to to complain to my brother about whatever you know whatever the situation was at the time and she just went into a whole little whole heap of cussing and bad words and all of that <laughs> um thinking that it was my brother right and so you know she wanted my brother to, to help her with a particular situation not realizing that it was my dad so she was continuing to talk and you know saying Craig this and Craig that etc that's my brother's name Craig this and Craig that not realizing, you know, that it was my dad who was on the phone and they do sound alike, right? And people also tell me that me and my mother sound alike, right? So within the household, right, you have what we call the echolect. And then within the society, within the speech community, when you have similar echolects coming together, we have a sociolect. All right, so we'll be looking a little bit more um, at those. So let me know if you've been told that your daughter sounds like you are your son or, you know, your mom, etc. Siblings, anybody?
No, not for me, but my kids sound alike. I kind of know them different now, but normally when I call the house phone, I get confused whenever, whichever answer, between the boy or the girl. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Well, you see, the thing is, you know, you you can say not for you because you're not going to notice it, really. Right? You're not going to notice it. Um, and if, if persons don't get the opportunity to hear your other family, then they wouldn't be able to say it to you. So we won't notice that we sound like, you know, our siblings or our parents, but other people will be able to tell us. And not only that, you know, people can also, apparently people can also identify you based on your speech. They can tell which school you attended. All right. So let me know. Let me get some feedback now from you guys if you've heard, you know, if you've been told anything like that. Miss, would nonverbals and little, like nonverbal cues um, matter? Would we take that into account too? Yeah, man, all of it. So like, all of it constitutes communication, yes. So I would, my brother sounds like dad, but then I would say, it's the behavior too. So if he's to say something, the way he would like turn his his mouth, like pucker his mouth and nose, and then he sighs and then he says it. So it's like the entire thing. So it's not just the sound in it. It's mm -hmm. the entire little mixture that comes with the sound, like the pause and the look and put the hand on the hip and then the speech. And you're like, the mm -hmm. sound like daddy, Mr. So this can real. And he said, why everybody keeps saying that? He said, even the way he drives. If he's talking to you and he's driving, he's going to do the same nonverbals, look at you and then talk just like that. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. You don't only sound like him, like all your nonverbals connect to, you know? Right, yes, definitely. So any aspect of communication. And then people don't usually like to hear it, you know? They're like when they say, you sound like so so I say, no. I'm like, you're not going to see it, but I'm, the, I'm, I'm looking on and I'm the one observing, so I'm going to see it. So you would definitely never ever see it, but I can tell you, you do behave and so on that, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember when I was, I was 18, right, fresh out of high school and I was working um, and at that particular place, you know, I remember one of my co-workers you know, while I was talking, he was like, oh, it's cool, you used to go. So I said, St. Hughes, he said, me know, man, me know, me know. You sound like a St. Hughes girl. I was like, what? Right? And then, of course, he proceeded to tell me how St. Hughes girls are. Right? So apparently, you know, and, and it makes sense because they're in the same space together every day. That's where you spend most of your waking hours as well right so they can tell if you if you attended um one particular school as opposed to another they can tell the, the campion students the rn students etc etc right but when you are within the group you can't necessarily identify the, the that unique song because you're in the group so you're not noticing it right Miss, I, I don't know if this counts, but um, I, I, I was at UA, I think it, like second year, and I heard the anthem. So I stopped for like, I was late for class and I heard the anthem and I stopped for like two seconds and I realized that, yo, I don't actually have to stop. I can go. And like one of my classmates saw and he's like, you went to Ulmas, didn't you? And I was like, yeah, because we have a thing at Ulmas that wherever you hear the anthem, you have to stop as long as you can hear it. You have to stop for the duration of it. So that's how, I don't know if it comes, but that's how he knew that I went to that school. Right. So, you know, and that's just general behavior, linguistic behavior, social behavior, right? Because we, we are also socialized within those environments, right? And again, it makes the, 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 the point about the community of practice as opposed to the speech community. Because again, you're spending most of your waking hours at school, right? And when you do that, 
you you are interacting a lot with your friends with your classmates and obviously that interaction is going to create communicative norms and you're going to sound different from from others who are outside of that community right so definitely you know that is that's something to to explore in linguistics in social linguistics if you guys are thinking about going further to do research in in, in language and communication etc all right so let me just continue with the clip groups of persons with family and close friends her language use is split 80 20 between igbo and english at work the reverse is true her language use is split 95 to 5 percent between english and igbo and in her french conversation club the split is 60 to 40 between french and english respectively all of these groups that achike is a part of are different speech communities and whenever she uses a different language inside one of these speech communities, it is called code switching. She may decide to code switch to facilitate communication between members of her speech community. It might be a requirement that she uses a specific language in certain contexts, and it could happen unconsciously. We could say that Achike is a multilingual individual that code switches between three different languages across a variety of speech communities. This is her social network. Each person in her various social networks also has their own idiolect. And whenever we group all these idiolects together, what we have is called a sociolect at the macrolinguistic level. Researchers who study the impact of language on the individual are called sociolinguists. Well, those who study the impact of language on society belong to a discipline called the sociology of language. Both of these areas are related in very important ways. Since it is not possible to separate macrolinguistic attitudes towards language from their origin at the microlinguistic level. Sociolinguist Max Weinrich once said, A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. What he meant here was that the difference between a language and a dialect. Okay, so guys, remember this now has to do with your first assignment. So listen up. At least the way that these terms are used normally isn't a scientific or a linguistic difference, but it is a sociopolitical one. The word language is used for forms of speech which have power and prestige or the army and navy while dialect is used for forms of speech which lack this prestige but this distinction has no basis in linguistics all languages are dialects which means none is more intrinsically prestigious than another any prestige that a language has accrued is a purely socially constructed form of prestige which can change with time and circumstances. To avoid these loaded social terms, linguists often use the neutral phrase speech variety when investigating different speech styles across speech communities. Nonetheless, these social constructs can have far-reaching impacts on the individual and the wider society as we shall go on to see later. All right. So anything else before we move on? Yes, Karen. Um, I'm not sure if I missed it, but there is a word that he used, apart from the idiolect and the sociolect, he used um, echolect or something like that. Um, but I don't remember the um, explanation for that one. I know that 
the idiolect is the variation of the language, the sociolect is within the community. So um, can you remind me what was the echo left? Sorry, I was so the Ecolect is a collection of similar, similar idiolects, particularly within a household. So that would, in essence, be your, your family members. So remember, we just had that discussion right. about so like your siblings, etc. Right, right, right. Right. So that's the Ecolect. Okay. Thanks, Miss. Okay, no problem. Miss, would I be going off tangent if I say that I, I don't necessarily understand that statement? Do you want me to leave that for another time for us to discuss the languages of dialect of the I'm in the Navy? That's okay. Oh, you're not understanding the statement. Have you started to read anything on it as yet? I, I definitely did start to read, right? But without reading, I would not see that it was saying that, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay. Like, you know, you would see the, see the... Mm -hmm. Were you at the session where we discussed it? Yes, miss, but it's, it's just not reaching. I don't know why. So I'm seeing it, I'm being influenced now based on my reading, right? But I don't know how deep I can go to personally put my views on it because I don't know if without these massive readings, if I would have understood what it was being, what was being What is said. your understanding of it? That's the thing. It's just only because I read it, I really understood what but it I'm was asking being. you, what is your understanding of it now? It's um, a distinction between what a language is and what a dialect is. I don't even know if I'm right. So it's like a distinction, really. One of prestige, that saying that a language would be more prestigious than a dialect. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I on the right track? I don't know. Somebody save me, please. Yes. I'm, but I'm waiting for like a sentence. That's it, Miss. I don't have a sentence. <laughs> well, maybe I need to speak to you privately. Is anyone else okay. having that um, challenge? Regarding the, the, the statement itself, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. The fact that there has to be some kind of force behind a dialect for it to be named a language. Miss, can I try and, and explain it to me? Go ahead. Man, it's like, think of, okay, think of China, right? Mm -hmm. Just think of it as a country in and of itself. Would mm -hmm. China be the superpower that it is, if it, is it, if it didn't have like the army and the navy and the weapons that it has? Mm -mm. It, it, would just it be wouldn't a be. Country. It would just be a little country. Another country. Just mm -hmm. another country. So transfer that to your understanding of language and dialect. Now, la every language is a dialect. Right, but mm. you're looking at um, the social construct that people put on language, then it's basically saying that language is a dialect with an army and a navy. So language is China with army, navy, nuclear weapons, right? If it, so it needs have support, army, it needs support, it needs power, it needs force, it needs backative. If it doesn't have the backative, then it's just a regular old dialect. It's like Jamaican, it's like Patwa. In a mm. sense, it's, it's part of it. You have no army, you have no navy, you have nothing. It's just you talk it, that's it. Get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it's so like I that. guess now I would have to highlight what those support would be, right? Mm -hmm. That would make it, okay. All right. That would make it like a language. So for the most yeah. part, things that make it a language would be like, for instance, government approval. So like in Haiti, when they made Haitian Creole um, the second language, right? But government mm -hmm. approval also goes a long way because then you would be able to teach it in schools, you would be able to use it in formal settings, whatever. So government approval, societal approval, because government can approve anything they feel like they approve. And if the society doesn't agree to it, then it get knocked. So governmental mm -hmm. approval, societal approval, um, mm -hmm. 
having yeah, a so dictionary. So just like how our Creole now is not really mm-hmm. supported, right? Because mm-hmm. we really have not gotten that that recognition that we'd want it to get get per se, right? Exactly. Like Creole, so, Patois, yeah, so, as you said. Yeah, so it's like, so Creole or Creole is basically a dialect without an army or an army. Okay, so I understand. So it's really a metaphorical reach. Yeah. All right, thank you, Makini. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Miss, for accommodating me. That has been a little bit better for me. Okay, Vanessa. Thank you, Makini. Um, why I asked about, you know, if you were at the session, the discussion session, is because exactly what Makini said is what we had discussed. And I remember using Haiti as an example. So thanks again, Makini, for um, pointing those out. So let us go back to the, the slides. All right, so we're going to be looking at the nature of language variation the relationship between linguistic variation and social variation. We're going to be looking at markers, indicators, and stereotypes. Now, of course, um, as I said earlier, you we will be covering this topic for about two to three weeks. All right. So we might not cover all of these things today, just to bear that in mind. All right. So it says, do you speak the same way all the time? No individual speaks the same way all the time. Their speech varies depending on several social factors. And this variation in speech is called language variation. So we're gonna be looking at internal variation, variation within the language and variation of a speaker, right? So the speaker has different ways of communicating depending on the context. All right, so, you know, I already said that language variation is a hallmark of sociolinguistics. Variability in language is within everyone's experience of using and listening to language, right? So even going back to our discussion about how to effectively maneuver in the communication space within the various domains, you know, going downtown, versus uptown, uh, versus the country, et cetera, and having knowledge of uh, those varieties and linguistic norms, all right? So definitely, we, based on our communicative competence, we are able to move from domain to domain using different varieties based on what the domain requires, all right? And that is a big part of your communicative competence. So if you don't know how to react or communicate differently based on the settings, then something is wrong with your communication skills, right? And we know, for instance, with autistic children, you know, they would, would demonstrate depending on the, the level of the, 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 the spectrum, you know, sometimes they would behave anyway in any context, right? So apart from that, you know, growing up, you will learn how to effectively communicate within the various domains or contexts. So internal variation refers to the property of languages of having different ways of expressing the same meaning, right? So for instance, we say cars, automobiles, vehicles, ride. What other terms we use for, for car? Any other words for car? Uh, kind of a slangish, what I would say, wheels. Wheels, yes. 
anything else? What was that? Any other terms for car? So Jenny said wheels. No, it wasn't me. It was Kaivon. Nothing is coming to mind for me. Oh, Kaivon said that. Okay. Um, oh, Kaivon. No, I think it's. I think it's Ella Barland. Oh, I thought it was your mic <laughs> to come up. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, walking versus walking. Uh, differences in syntax of so back up to this versus, of course, this, this phrase is kind of obsolete now. But, you know, back up the disk versus back the disk up. Some people say develop it versus develop it up. In Jamaica, we're talking about now, right? What are some of the other ways? Would reverse and reverse it be one? Yeah. Or uh, uh, some people say reverse back. Reverse back, right. Mm -hmm. Right. So within language, we can have different ways of conveying the same meaning depending on the context. So for instance, wheels you know who would use wheels versus vehicle sometimes it's a matter of age right sometimes it also depends on the type of vehicle right so growing up if it's an older car we would call it a jalopy for instance oh, yeah i never remember the word there yes <laughs> right so again the, the variation would be dependent on the context. But as there is much variation within and among the speech of Jamaicans. Take, for example, different ways of pronouncing the word education. So some would say education, 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 etc. Any other pronunciations? I've heard edu. Mm -hmm. Come like a J or a G there after they would come by with the D. Right. So again, depending on context, depending on the individual, you know, they might choose a particular uh, variety over another. So we have what we call regional or horizontal variation. Right, regional variation marks off the residents of one region from those of other regions, right? So idiolects that are similar along a horizontal plane, these are known as regional dialects. So within Jamaica, again, right, we can look across the various parishes and usually we can tell, usually we can tell where an individual is from based on their speech. And every time we have this discussion, you know, students might say, oh, St. Elizabeth people chat the words patwa. Now, what exactly do you mean by that, right? We can definitely tell when someone is from the West, you know, we can tell when someone is from Clarendon and so on, right? We are usually able to listen to the, 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 the speech of the individual and to identify their place of origin, all right? Of course, in some speech communities, that's not possible. In some communities, that's not possible to, you know, just hear a representative or someone from the community and say, yeah, man, this person is from X place. So for instance, Fort Moore. Fort Moore is a dormitory community and you have people coming from all over people coming from rural parishes 
people coming over from Kingston, right, to live in Portmore, people coming from other areas within St. Catherine to live in Portmore. So you find that it is kind of like a linguistic melting pot. There is no unique markings of somebody who comes from Portmore, right? Because you can you can go out and you can go to, to, to the, the store and you hear the basilect and it's a Portmore resident. Likewise, you can hear the acrylic and it's a Portmore resident, right? And even when you, you want to think about, okay, well, maybe it's based on the communities, right? So maybe you want to say, okay, it's based on the communities that you would have the, 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 the regional type of variation, but that's also not the case. All right, because you have people coming from all over living in any community in Port Moore because of the nature of the community as a dormitory community. So people can pay rent anywhere. All right. So, but usually we're able to tell um, definitely Kingston, they have what they call the, the uptown draw, which we will look at. Uh, Dr. Allison Irving, she studied, you know, that particular dialect. And then you have the so-called uh, downtown slang, right? Where, you know, there is a, the, 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 the stressing of vowels and so on, you know, the lengthening of vowels, where you have the versus, you know, um, other types of pronunciation. So, you find that you are able to tell that, okay, this person is from X community in downtown Kingston, for instance, right? So we can usually tell, usually we can tell where an individual is from based on their speech, right? So we're looking at regional dialects, regional variation, all right? And of course we call it horizontal variation as well, because it's happening across that horizontal plane. All right. Any examples you can think of in terms of regional dialects? Do you speak a regional dialect? All right, so the camp in 1961. So guys, remember, if you're typing, I'm not going to be able to see it. I'm sharing screen now. All right, so the camp in 1961, he decided to do some work on variation in Jamaica. And what he did was to look at the different terms for the word machete, right? Or we call it a machete or the cutlass. Right, those are the, the two what, most popular terms that we use to refer to this item, right? And so he went across the parishes and let us look at some of the results. So if you notice the, the instruments here, they have different shapes. Um, before I move on, apart from, from machete and cutlass or cutlass, any other words? Or Maybe last. Or yes, last, which is a derivative of cutlass. Last. Yes. Last, last. All right. Machete. Some people pronounce it weird. Machete, right. But Something it, like that. Right. So those, very good. And those are, would be offshoots of the machete and the cutlass, right? Last and machete and machete, etc. All right. So these are some of the words that he found at that time. So remember this study was done when? 
1961. All right. So as I list them and they're written in the Cassidy, that's the official writing system for Jamaican. So there's Afana, Belly Uman, Brad Cutlass, Tree Butter, that should be Phyla, Granny Ear, Granny Beard, John Gilpin, Gore, Machiet, So, Mother Thomas, Bill, any, any, any one of them sounding familiar so far? Well, the bill, the bill yeah. sounds familiar. Maybe the bill, and the bill yeah. is heard in story. I've never heard anybody say right. it, said it, but only like Jamaican stories. But 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 the the the, the bill is not represented in in any of the objects that were shown, because the bill is a short and broader one, mm -hmm. and I, I think the. Cane cutters use that to cut cane, the bill. Mm -hmm. so, right, so I just got a, I just got right. a picture, I know. <laughs> right. right. So not really looking right. at the picture per se, right? Right. So, so, so the bill is shorter, um, it's broader, and it is normally shine because, you know, they file it to a point where in once it hit against the cane or touches the cane, right? It's straight through because they have to move fast. To cut a certain, um, to cut a certain number of rooms per day and all of that. So the bills are bit broader. So I know about the bill. Mm -hmm. right. The bill and the broad cutlass. I've heard the bill. Cutlass as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, the broad cutlass, round bill, rasmin, steamer, tickets, tickets rather, open yard, wampara. Straight Point and Zephly. Miss um, Doc, and they have one by the name of Ton Point. Many of you know the one they call it Ton Point, Mash it. Um, the, the, the end kind of curl in words, they call it Ton Point. Oh, it's, it's got the grapple? Well, I don't know if they call it the grapple somewhere, but I know it has a Ton Point. Oh, a grapple. Mm -hmm. Grapple and, on the top curve. Yes, man. And then they have a sharp one. Um, it's, it's just a bit longer than a normal knife. Then call the Cuban. Okay. The Cuban. Cuban. He's a man. Cuban. 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 He's a machine man, man. Miss. The Cuban. I've never heard but, any but, of but, these. But hold on. What do you observe? So each time he's commenting on one of them, he speaks about the shape of it and what it yeah, is. Description. For, what it is used for. So with the study, you had the variation because they named them according to the crops that were grown mm -hmm. in true, the true. parishes. Right? So that is actually what resulted in that, in the variation that we're we're discussing now. In terms okay. of the names, because the parishes had different crops, crops, different main crops, right? And so they would have different shapes. So they would have the need for different shapes in terms of the instruments. That's right? so true. That's so true, yes. Doc. Because where and I'm you from, know what? All right, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Where, where I'm from in Westmoreland, right? In Westmoreland, the main crop is actually sugarcane. Mm -hmm. Hence the bill. Hence the bill. The bill is your kid. So I'm aware of the bill because I'm from that area that has the main crop being sugar cane. So the bill is what is is what is used to really cut the cane. Right. And where I'm from, we do have sugar cane here, <clears throat> Clarendon, but it's not so much as your parish, right? So our main thing here of commerce is bauxite. So we do have farmers, but it's not on a large scale where you're going to have a lot of sugarcane farmers for me to even hear that term re resounding in mm. my parish. So I'm not belonging to the speech community of the farmers who they would know within their little surroundings that is called all of that. So that's why, Miss, I've never heard any of this. Never. Okay. Never. Well, well, you guys will have the opportunity to read the, the research itself. Right, so he, he has the 
the map, you know, so he does the mapping in terms of where these these terms are located and you will get to read further in terms of the crops, etc. All right. So you will you will have access to that article. It's very interesting, but it shows us that variation is also as a result of our socialization and our lifestyles. So what is what it is that we're doing? What is it that we are partaking in that would result in us having to use different terms, right? So across the parishes, you have different terms for you know this particular instrument based on the, the shape and based on the crops that they're growing within that area. All right. So we learned something new today. <laughs> and what you can do. For those of you, you know, from the rural parishes, you can also make note of these names and ask around, you know, to find out Miss. if others are familiar, because maybe your Miss. siblings and so on would know. Yes, Warika. Oh, I didn't know you were me. I was just talking to my uh, and the amount of names and this when I asked him if he knew of it and he said yes it's the one that um is the straight one is not the one with the curve he's a farmer when I read out everything to him he wasn't shocked about any of them so he knows the most I ever heard was mm -hmm. right and so also when we look at indigenous knowledge and language death you know we will talk about the the need to preserve cultural knowledge because what what will happen and what is happening is that you know we have a generation of jamaicans who they're growing up and they don't even know some of these things right it's it's news to them news to us right um and certain other things in terms of, as I said before, indigenous knowledge. So knowledge about herbal teas and, you know, which bush is good for what, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the importance of preserving languages, right, leads to the preservation of this knowledge. Because once we don't have that knowledge being shared, right, once we don't have the language rather that is used to discuss this knowledge, then we won't have that knowledge to pass on. All right. So, so that is something that we will explore a little bit more when we look at language death. All right. So that's that's it for regional variation. Then we move on to social variation. Um, me sorry to cut you. I know one other regional. I think it's regional. Lada bag versus scandal bag. Yeah, man, um, that's Montego Bay, that's the West. But that's the only parish I heard it from. I heard right. with it. Okay. So there is some story, there would be some some story behind why it's from there only. From where? From from um, from the West in right. entirety, right? So you'd have uh, St. James, Hanover, Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Because I, I can't oh, really but I only know St. James. I get ready to do a lot about things because when the girl should say a lot about Right. <laughs> Hold on there. So repeat the parishes, St. James. Hanover, West Berlin. Oh, I never know them do it too. Yeah. In the way. Yeah. To, to be honest with you, um, even though Hanover is a parish, you know, the, the, um, it shares borders with what? St. James and West Berlin. So normally, there's normally commonalities among those mm -hmm. three parishes. Norman Kevin. May I tell you a few things? Even in terms of regional variation, we can talk about the West, the, the West versus the East versus Central Jamaica. And you will find that the dialects are similar according to region as well. So that's a very good point. Right? That even according to region, you will find similarities amongst the speakers all right so moving now to to social dialect and, and vertical variation 
right? We're now talking about social class and groupings, all right? So we're talking about differences in speech as it relates to social groups, whether it be gender, whether it be according to age, whether it be according to class, right? And so what we find is that there is an association with levels of the cruel continuum with social classes. So for instance, the, the Basilect is often associated with members from the rural communities. And oftentimes they think that, you know, these individuals would be in the poorer class of Jamaicans. And these are these are terms that are being used loosely, of course. And then you talk about Jamaican rule now in terms of the mesolite being used by the working class and the upper second class, etc. All right. And so you have differences being developed within each group. And because they are interacting with each other, if you're not in the group, you, you won't be able to share those communicative norms. So you might hear them and you probably don't even understand the meaning. All right. So those of you from rural areas, as we go along too, you can let us know because they, they you know, would put people in categories based on the level of the, the, the dialect that they're using. So remember we said that a dialect is a variety of a language. It's simply a variety of a language. That's our linguistic definition. Right? So when we talk about dialects of Jamaican Creole, because all languages have dialects, right? A dialect is just, in this case, a difference in, for, for instance, pronunciation and vocabulary, right? So same Jamaican Creole, but you just have different norms and different pronunciations as well, right? So with social class, we're looking at the, the attributes, the social attributes of the individuals. So it says our main focus for this course is on social variation. So we want to look now at the linguistic variable. Let me just change something on the setting here.
could you go back for just a minute, please, miss? Thanks. Thank you. Nice quick question. Is this PowerPoint going to be up in the classroom? Hello, can anybody hear me? Yes, you're gonna I can, I can hear you. Yes, you're mm -hmm. gonna get the actual recording, but I'm asking now for different pronunciations of that word on the screen. So I won't say the word because I want to hear a whole guys how many pronouns are possible for the word economy 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 is economy oh, one? economy right yeah economy economy so economy economy and economy and are you are you thinking of any differences in terms of you would say which one Economy. Economy, economy. And there is economy, economy. We could probably so some be... people say economy, some say economy. Economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't economy. get the social. Um... No, no, I'm not saying, I'm asking a question. So oh. again. And when you say who, miss, different... your who means like the class, the different classes in Jamaica or so on? Yeah, are you? Yeah, but when I get that, do you okay? So you're saying that you don't, you don't see that happening. You're, you're not finding, um, yeah, no, man. because what happened, you know, there are some persons who will pronounce a word how they learn it. So even though them call every other word wrong, like oh, you don't know, you have certificate and certificate, you will hear them make all of those mistakes. And then when it comes to certain words, them do it correctly. So I'm not picking it up for this word, right? So for some of the variants you won't have any social information attached. And we're gonna look at what we classify these variants to be. Right? But you're not getting any social information. Now, so if you, you add an H to it, maybe. It's me stop kill people with H now, because sometimes me get to know myself and pronounce words with H for no reason. Okay. Right. So traditionally, though, you know, people would would, would classify, you know, individuals when they, they have that H for, for emphasis, as they say, right? So the variable, go away, for instance. So we have linguistic variable, um, not linguistic, sorry. Syntactic variables, we have phonological variables and morphological variables as well. All right, so the variable go away, variants leave, que, galang, guan, anything else? Would move be one? 
Yes. Would Kiro, um, would, um, what do you say? Kiro be one? What, what is that again? Kiro. <laughs> Kiro. Yes. Okay. And, um, <laughs> I haven't heard that one in quite a while. <laughs> and um, wait, the last one come book. Last one is what? Come. Can you say that again? Go. Come book. Come book. Oh, go. Yes. Go. Come book. Yes. Right. And that one, that one I say within the last probably two to three years has been made popular by social media users so you will see people using that as a regular comment you know and it can be that they find the the the, the, the post funny you know or they're being dismissive right so it is the context that would really determine what they mean um that's what hope has not been used on social media to literally mean to like go somewhere but as an expression of agreement or laughter, right? Yes. Who was commenting? So I thought I was hearing um, someone else commenting. Right? But if you if you really if you really study it, you you realize that a lot of these they have you know, different different meanings depending on the context as well. So even something like gala, you know, sometimes when people use it, they don't literally mean for you to go away or go along, which is where the, the, the word comes from. But it, it can be, you know, just a, a term expressing agreement, as I said before, laughter, um, not necessarily being dismissive all the time so it shows the importance of context as well and then of course we have the the phonological ones so ringing versus ringing so we're talking about the alveolar nasal versus the velar nasal so n versus in so that ringing that good sound ringing versus ringing n, right which would be the the velar nasal the n sound okay and then we have with 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 and probably with right so right here we are looking at phonological variation differences in pronunciation. Any other differences that you might want to mention where there's a there's a surface form, there's an underlying form and perhaps yes. with for with the T would be D with. Right. Yes. But I mean any other example, you know, not just what is on the um the, the, the slide here. Any other example where you want to give us the underlying form and the surface forms? Can't think of any. Okay, give another ING one. Yes, no problem. Go in. Mm -hmm. It's a go in. Instead of going, mm -hmm. and sometimes wine, wine. <laughs> you know <that> one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I wine the so and so. So it's actually yes. coming from going too. Yes, right. And what we're noticing, you know, with some of these things, you will find that the the, the older. So the person who said Kiro was it Vanessa? Right, the older people would probably use that, right? Perhaps if you if you speak with a it was team. Janice. Oh, it was Janice. Okay, perhaps if you speak with a team, you know, and, um, and you tell them to cure out, they might not. Perhaps they would get it from the context, you know, but they might not be readily able to identify uh, 
what what exactly you mean by he wrote. All right, Marlon, yes. you want to Yes, yes, I'm at as clown being country bumpkin. Country bumpkin? Yes, he wrote. It's not a modern expression or not a very popular kind of city like expression. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> right, so it's more it's more popular in the basilect. Yes, miss. Yes, right. That's great. All right, let us look at some lexical variables now. So eat versus nyam, for instance, girl versus gal, etc. And with some phonological ones, you will have uh, Cat versus cat or garden versus garden, and then the use of the H, right? And of course, more for syntactic variables, for example, pluralization, she sings versus she sings, right? And this can mean the difference between two dialects. So with African American vernacular English, they would say she sings. Oh, she sings so good, or whatever. And then standard American English would be she sings, right? So sometimes the variables would be concentrated within a particular dialect. So we can use these variables to mark off dialects. All right, any examples for lexical? So lexical variables. So we have eat versus nyam. Any other word that we can use? Or you can give me one on your own. Um, Miss, would this be like, for instance, when um, in Potter, or in, well, Jamaican people, they say Q-Tex for every kind of nail polish? <laughs> All that right. would this count? Okay, so that now is a type of, and it's not just Jamaicans, it's, it's found in the speech of Black people, right? So you will find it in African-American vernacular English and other Creole languages. So this is a process that we call semantic broadening, right? And it is where we use the, the name of even a particular brand or a particular item to refer to all items. So for instance, tea in Jamaica is really a hot any beverage. hot beverage yes hot beverage so if you want cocoa tea milo tea mint tea uh, coffee tea, tea <laughs> coffee tea yeah <laughs> right so ginger tea right so we it, that's an example right where we use the one word to apply to all others within that similar category, semantic broadening. But with the, the brands now, we do that as well. So Colgate is used to refer to all toothpaste, whether it is uh, fresh or uh, what are the others that they have? Fremsodyne. Fremsodyne and all of that. The Aqua Fresh is another one. But it just yes yes right um, <coughs> they, um, so oh sorry yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah vaseline fab. <laughs> yes fab, any so that is fab. yes anyone right. <laughs> so it's not just jamaicans <laughs> you know sometimes we think that these things are unique to us but we realize that you know others actually do the same, where they might use a brand or just one particular term to refer to to other things within that category, and we don't really specify. All right. 
or for some people they don't even know, notice the difference all right so that was a very good question any other any 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 other examples for phonological variation so for instance the cat versus cat or garden versus yard dog for dog mm -hmm. snake for snake yes lovely screw for stew can you repeat that one screw for stew Mm, true. Not hearing. Like stew chicken, strew chicken. Yeah, or strew peas. Oh, with, the, with that roti addition. Yes, yeah, so, so this is strew for stew. Oh, that's so true. Well, you know, there the, the, the are things like people versus people. You guys know that one? Yes, I've heard that one. I've been surprised. It's people. It's people. people. <laughs> you listen to me, the man, and you will hear people. Yes. A family. <laughs> yes. Family. A family. Why do even say family? Come on now. I don't know how they get to be. But these are, these, again, these are phonological processes. We look at some of them when we look at the formation of Creole, right? Uh, but these are phonological processes, for instance. Vowel epenthesis, aphesis, all of these are responsible for things like flim and dex and ox. And again, I point out that these are not unique to Jamaican Creole. Right? So you will hear the African Americans using these words as well. So they say dex and they would say ox. Right? And remember, so we have to go back to the formation of Creole and, you know, we have to look at the West African languages and the phonological processes present in West African languages that were not present in English. And so in acquiring English, they would still use their phonological rules to pronounce English words. So it's not that them chat bad. It's not that them never, them, them couldn't learn the writing. All that was happening was that they were processing English words using their own phonology. All right? And so you will get things like simit, smoke, flim, etc. All right, guys? But we will look at that when we look at Creole languages. But bear that in mind, that is not nothing wrong with nobody. It's not that they never have the ability to say film, but because they were acquiring English vocabulary using their own phonological rules, you have the creation of new sounds, okay? And then you have differences. As so, Miss, do you really, really think that so nothing is wrong with their tongue? With whose tongue? <laughs> One that's a family. With how they pronounce it. Not, you really think that they can pronounce it different? It's a phonological process, and if they learn it as family, that's what they're gonna it's say. It's gonna stick. It's not about them having any speech impediment or anything of the sort. Okay. So if if you grow up in a speech community where the people say flim, automatically in acquiring language you're gonna say flim. Can those persons be unlearned? No, it's gonna be hard. So why would they want to unlearn it? No, not saying like anything forced, but you know, say for instance, we have somebody like that growing up in that speech community, right? And now they're in a formal setting of like doing their degree or studying or in a more professional environment. And you know, now you realize that you're the only one who is saying family or stuff like that, or somebody actually corrected you. 
is it going to be hard for them now to oh, go to say people, well listen realistically if they reach to that level and they're doing all of that obviously they're competent in english mm -hmm. so they, right so they they would know based on their communicative competence which variety to use so if they're if they're you know pursuing a degree etc the the assumption is that they would have to have some knowledge of english the university well UE has the the english language test that they need to do right to enter and they have the various foundation courses so certainly if they write it in an essay or they, they're speaking and they use it obviously they would know that so so i don't want us to think that people who say family and people and flim have any kind of disability or any kind of speech impediment or anything of the sort it's just another way of pronouncing a word that's all it is and if we were not exposed to the various ways of speaking we would have just talked one way and we wouldn't see it as anything because that is how we would have acquired language right so i want us when we're talking about variation to bear that in mind that there is nothing wrong with any speaker if they say flim or if they say ax it's based on their socialization and the language the variety of creole that they acquired and if they get into to, to, to formal situations, right? Then, for instance, studying, then the assumption is that they would have some sort of English language proficiency. However, there are those individuals who will have to interact in formal settings who they are monolingual patra speakers, basal lector patra speakers, and that is what they speak. And when we look at linguistic discrimination, we will look at the fact that people should be allowed to speak in the way that they know and be served in that particular language, regardless of the setting. So in moving on, as we discussed Labov, before and I said that he was the founding father of sociolinguistics and he came up with some terms to explain linguistic variation and linguistic variables right so we're going to look at some of these terms that he came up with and we'll be discussing Labov quite a bit in the course all right so he's the founding father of sociolinguistics and we said that Joshua Fishman is the founding father of the sociology of the language. So you're going to be hearing a lot about Fishman. You're going to be hearing a lot about Labov, particularly the studies that they did that we, we thought, you know, they were so groundbreaking at the time. All right. So Labov, in 1972, he placed linguistic variables in categories. Right, so the first one is the indicator. Now, remember when we spoke about economy versus economy, and you know, someone said that they're not getting any social differences. That's because that word, in terms of differences in pronunciation, it is simply an indicator. And with an indicator, it is a linguistic variable to which little or no social meaning is attached. So you can really pinpoint where the speaker would be from. You can't say that economy sound more uptown than economy, than economy, because you're hearing these, you know, being used by, by members of the, the, the community who are from diverse backgrounds. So you don't have a social alignment, a social class alignment with that variable. So those variables with no social information attached, so we can identify where the speaker is from. So remember when we spoke about Ladabab, 
I would say, all right, anybody who, you know, uses a lot of bag, perhaps they're from the West or they are affiliated with someone from the West, right? So that now gives you social information, but with an indicator, it is a linguistic variable to which little or no social meaning is attached, right? And it says that it is not really studied, just noted. So we're not really interested in indicators because they're not giving us anything. They just indicate slight differences in sound, but they're not giving us any social information. So when I ask the question about economy, you guys are saying, well, no, we're not really getting anything. We're not, you know, getting that this person is from this, this community or this social class. We're really not, you know, getting any information from that, right? Because it's an indicator. So let me know if you are thinking of any other indicators, any other examples of an indicator. So we use the, the, the economy example, right? Economy, economy. Can you think of any? I can I can probably make reference to schedules. So I'll just do another one and then you can tell me if you're thinking of anything. So economy versus uh not economy, schedule versus schedule. Do you get any social information from any of those? So if I say I'm gonna schedule an appointment versus schedule an appointment, or I'm going to check my schedule, or I'm going to check my schedule. Are you no. getting differences? Okay, so Vanessa says no. Not really, not really. I've never, I'm thinking about it in my, mm -hmm. in my profession, my field. I'm wondering when, it's just a really a variety of choice to be on schedule. Remind us of your profession again. Teacher. Right. Okay. So I'm thinking my principals use it interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Admin use it interchangeably. Teachers alike use it interchangeably. Mm -hmm. So I don't get mm -mm. any it's sort of like a preference to be honest. Yeah. Right. So that is that's an example of an indicator. So if you say schedule, you're not getting that okay. The person who says schedule mm -hmm. lower or higher. Yeah. Like children too. You have children and you have children. Well, that one is a bit different. Children, children. Social information there. What, Miss? What do you think? You have to I call think? the children them children. For them to hear children. As opposed to? Children. So what is children? I, I hear people say children and question. And, and where question. Miss, I want to know. To like you hear question and you don't hear question. And I'm like, huh? I'm like, huh? What? Question. Oh, so are and those question. indicators or are those markers? So let us look at markers. So a marker <laughs> is a linguistic variable which carries with it social significance. They are potent carriers of social information. So when you hear, when you hear the word, when you hear girl versus girl, for instance, mm -hmm. right, you know that. Yes, this carries social information. When you hear say Mary, Mary is with child versus Mary a breed that carries. And she had a miscarriage other than mean? she lose the baby. So Mary breed <laughs> conjures up ideas of what about Mary? It was done loosely. Right. It wasn't in, 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 in marriage. It was out right. of wedlock. <laughs> right. So it probably was Because clearly married people cannot breed, you know? Right. So it has to be people who not, yeah. Versus Mary, <laughs> pregnant. Pregnant or with child. Child, exactly. So that, no, we can say, yeah, that's a, that's a marker because it's marking off differences in terms of Mary's character. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it says people are aware of markers and the distribution of markers is clearly related to social groupings and to styles of speaking. So I want you guys to give me some examples of markers. 
So I think the children versus children, I believe that that's a marker. Because you don't, hear, very, no, for you don't hear the, the average Jamaican saying children. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay. And you don't hear the, the average Jamaican saying idea. Mm -mm. We say idea. Mm -hmm. Vanessa? Where's the rest of the class? Is only Vanessa? <laughs> Or teacher, some stars. <laughs> in, 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 instead of like you know, lawyer, you get the uh versus the right. So that's a shua. We call that a shua. Yeah, the shua. In linguistics. Versus right. who's gonna say teacher or the teacher? Er, 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 if, if, mm -hmm. All right. So like, so you said like the breed versus the pregnant or the so that child. would be a lexical variable and it's a marker because mm -hmm. we're getting social information so anytime you can identify social information it's a marker whether social information about the situation or the characters being discussed or social information about the speakers all right so would um mm, niaman eat Right, but remember I gave you guys that example. You want standard English? No, I'm oh, saying you did, no, did gave us that already. Example. So yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so perhaps you can give me other words within that. So other variants then. So remember the variant is the surface form. So the underlying form is eat. Um, a variant would be nyam. What are some other variants? And then we can decide if that's a marker. So nyam is definitely a marker, right? Mm -hmm. Nyam gives us social information. So, you know, if the person said them want nyam, some food versus mm -hmm. eat, you know, it can say that they're very hungry. So that's giving us social information, right? I'm or if, I'm yeah. hungry. Right. I'm famished. famished. I had to turn around my, and I said to her, I said, so you're going so far? Mm -hmm. So you're going so far? You're hungry? And she yes. said, yes. Mm -hmm. So famished and hungry. Right. That's um, a Miss, may I yes, just, um, may I speak, Miss? Yes, go ahead. Um, The first time I used the word nyam uh, was was about when i was i was um about you know two years you know a resident of jamaica for two years at that time so i i said nyam nyam, nyam food and uh, the the adult at that time said no 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 don't say nyam, you know, they yeah. talk bad when you say nyam. So that's the time I realized that um, in, the, in, in the, the same Creole, the same vernacular that we use, they, 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 they are the language, there are the terms that are considered bad language. Yeah. So I said, don't say nyam, don't say nyam. And I, I, I use it again. Um, I don't know context my friends who mm -hmm. speak the, the same Creole, the same vernacular. And they said that um don't say yam. <laughs> so, so I wondered oh, what, what is it that I'm saying wrong? But but I said don't say yam. And I use yam, they said that I, I thought bad. Mm-hmm. Right, and then you know, within the well, we discussed this before, and in the, the male setting, you know, Kaivon can explain to you the um, other reasons. No, why. I know, I know the male setting, you know, yeah, you, you know, you, 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 you can say eat and yam. No, mm -hmm. sir, it's a different setting, yeah, sir. You have to speak and stew, yeah, you have to speak and stew, Kaivon, you have to speak so. Some yeah. food. I know. Give it to the man that why so, get so, so if I say that guy man I, I get a why out. So so why I, I consume. I consume. Yeah, yeah. You consume. Yeah, you consume. Yes. 
because yeah. there are social there right. are social mm -hmm. consequences if you don't use the right marker right if you don't use the right linguistic variable mm -hmm. so thank you so much for sharing that any other examples of markers when you hear the person use a particular term or it might be the syntax, you know, you, you, you can tell that this person is of this social class or they're from a particular area or they do a particular kind of job or they, they have, you know, a particular level of education. So when you hear it, you know, you, 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 you say, yes, this, this individual belongs to this group. Now, with Labov's NYC study, which we will look at, he focused on, and I think we, we can probably, let me look at, or I may have to that. Right. So he looked at variation in terms of roticity, that's the use of, of R, in three department stores. And these department stores, you would say they have different uh, markets. So Macy's, I, I believe, was one, Saks, and a department, like a, a local department store. Those of you are familiar with New York, perhaps we could say Bobby's. Anybody familiar with Bobby's? Or D's department store? No? All right, so we can, because I'm not remembering, I think they're out of business now anyway. So it would have been Saks, Macy's, and this other department store. And we can perhaps use some Jamaican equivalents as it relates to, let's, let's try supermarkets then. So we can, we can talk about Price Mart, Mega Mart and Shoppers, Shoppers there. Yes. <laughs> All right. And so he went into these stores asking for the the men's department, and he or what whichever department is on the fourth floor, he would ask for that department because he wanted them to pronounce fourth floor, right? And you know he he found that when he went into Price Mart, for instance, they would say fourth floor, and he would hear the roticity. Then for Mega Mart, to some extent, but in Shopper's Fair, you would hear something like the fourth floor or the fourth floor right so no roticity at all and so he was able to determine that the rless variety is really synonymous with lower class speech based on that particular experiment all right in terms of the fourth floor and what he did to determine which one was more prestigious was to to look at how they would pronounce the words on the second go. So, you know, can you tell me where where's the, the men's department? Oh, it's on the fourth floor. And then he would say, excuse me. And then when they repeat, because when you're repeating, you're speaking more carefully because the assumption, right? And this is, this is, this is a subconscious one. The assumption is that something was wrong with your speech, so they never hear you the first time. So you perhaps slow it down and you say fourth floor, right? So on the second goal, he was able to determine that roticity is prestigious because it's more careful speech. And careful speech is synonymous with the prestigious form. Right? And so he was able to determine that the, 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 the fourth floor, right, the, 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 the lack of roticity there was really associated with the lower class. And he determined that based on the shoppers within these three stores. 
all right? But we will look, you know, closely at this study as well, all right? And then finally, we have what we call the stereotype. And the stereotype now is, so it, it's another linguistic variable. So remember, we came from the indicator, we just looked at the marker, now we're looking at the stereotype. And the stereotype is a popular and a conscious characterization of the speech of a particular group. It is a conscious belief that the people in this group are sudden talk, right? So it doesn't have to be true for people to believe it and for people to shape their expectations. So for instance, with Jamaicans, what are some of the stereotypes that you know, outsiders would have about our speech. So they would think that we say iry in every sentence. They would think that we say yemal. And then doc, they would also think that um, what we consider expletives, they would think that it's a common part to I to be identified as a Jamaican is an identifying factor to use our so-called Jamaican expletives. So, right. so, so to us, according to us, well, according to how we are cultured per se, it is um, um, our expletives are seen as bad. But to them, if you can pronounce or say the same vibes and at least mm -hmm. close accent is actually saying, okay, guess what? You're part of the culture, you're getting there. Mm -hmm. So they do, uh, yeah, so they do take kind to our so-called expletives and these expletives well you, you guys probably too young to remember but for instance on bet we used to hear these expletives quite a lot because you know at the time let's say in the early 90s they didn't uh recognize them as quote-unquote bad words so we were accustomed to hearing if a rapper if a rapper said BBC in him song, we hear BBC. If the rapper said BC, we hear BC, etc. Right? Until perhaps in the late 90s, you started to hear the bleep, bleep, bleep. So they, they would, of course, censor their curse words, but not ours, because they were not familiar you know, with the word, they just thought that, as you say, it's something cool to say. So if you look at, what's his name, son? Oh, Lord. Is, is it Tom Hanks? Yes, in same one, yes. Yeah. He's a whole heap of BBC, RC. General, general. And for him, it's just this act of identity that, you know, as such a make and talk. So as a it's a culture. Talk. Yeah, it's a culture. It's, it's a culture. It's a culture. Part. So, you know, BET, they, they would have get away with playing those songs that, that have the, the, the so-called curse words because they weren't aware. And then when they were made aware, you know, you find that they start to bleep, bleep, bleep. So that's an expectation. So that's a stereotype that we just walk around using these words all the time. Now, mind you, if you, if you, if you step outside, perhaps you're, you're, you're bound to hear within one hour or even 30 minutes, depending on where you live, you're bound to hear two curse words. So, mm, you know, it, 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 that one has some, 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 some basis then we can say, but like the Yemen and Iriman, you know, these things are per perpetuated based on movies, really, right? And so they, they think that that is how we speak all the time. You know, to say no problem, man, etc., and it's not it's not man. They are saying man because, of course, that is how they can pronounce it based on what they. Yes, and it annoys me. <laughs> well, if you want to be annoyed, I would suggest that you watch how Stella got her groove back with what's his name? Angela Bassett. Tay Diggs played the Jamaican hunk that she fell in love with. And if you want to be annoyed, watch that, watch that movie, all right? Okay. <laughs> the representation was awful, downright awful. So if you guys watched 
pool runnings, as in the original pool runnings, the, the approximations, they're not so bad. All right? So they, they kind of sound like Jamaicans, like they have knowledge of how we speak, but with tailings, not at all. So may, maybe next week or, or yes, Wednesday, the next class, maybe I will just play a little clip for you guys to hear it, right? It's, it's awful, that's all I can say. But we have these stereotypes, people from St. Elizabeth speak deep Creole and then chat back. That's a stereotype that we have within our culture. Or in America, they say that Texans or Southern people, they always say howdy and y'all. Right, and when you interact with individuals from these speech communities, you know you might be shocked to find out that they are not sounding like that. Because I remember, you know, one of my classes, one of my students, we were having this very discussion, and she's like, "Miss, I'm from Saint Elizabeth, and I don't sound like that." You know, so we have these stereotypes. These are popular and conscious beliefs about the speech of groups. And if if we, we, we hear that we're going to interact with, you know, an individual from a particular group, we're expecting to hear that type of speech. Also with Africans, you know, everybody in, 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 in trying to sound like an African, they would say, oh, at the end of everything. Right? Like, Miss, hurry up and done the class. Oh, <laughs> I can't. You know, I know I'm an African Miss, accent. Miss, <laughs> Miss, yes? Miss, as, as you say that, you know, one of the things that I found very annoying was that after, I, you know, you know, my friend asked me to, to speak in African. And, uh, and they don't hear the O at the end. Oh, that? Then say, then say, you know, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they say, you don't talk like African. But I said, I gave you, I gave you my, my original language. Because they have it that every African, they have to have the O. So when I, when I speak my, when I speak the Swahili, they say that they don't hear the O. You know, I, I normally found it very annoying in the initial stages. Right. So the, it, it, it's an expectation that they have because, you know, everything is oh, oh, so they're expecting it to sound like that, right? Not realizing that that might be used just for expression purposes within particular regions, within particular dialects, etc. right? So we've covered linguistic variables, the variants. We've looked at the indicator, which is a linguistic variable with little or no social information. We've looked at the marker, which carries potent social information and the stereotype, which is a popular and conscious belief about the speech of a particular group of individuals. So on Wednesday, we're going to continue by looking at extra linguistic variables, the speaker variables, group variables, situation variables. We're going to be looking at the speaker variables. Then we move on to look at group variables. And we're going to talk about social class because we've been using that term loosely. You know, what, what, is, what is a social class? How do we put people in groups? How do we put children in these various classes that are available? Is it by their parents? Is it by where they live? Is it by the school that they might attend or the language that they speak, right? So we're gonna be looking at those things. Then we're gonna look at situation variables and move on from there. All right, guys, any questions? The class was great, Miss. Okay, Enjoy your class. You. Thank you so much for sharing. Also, we we love your little uh, stories and and experiences. So continue to share them with us.
Yes, class was good. All right, thank you. All right, so let me let me just end this slide and I am going to just bring up the, let me see if I can find it quickly. How is the assignment going, guys? Because Vanessa kind of scared me a while ago. So. <laughs> miss, miss, which assignment, Miss? Oh? Which assignment? Who is that? Kaiwan. Oh, Lord. So the assignment that we discussed in the first, was no, it was the second. Um, it was on the was, Wednesday. So I'm gonna was, bring it up now. Geez. Let me um and you have like a month, I believe. I'm gonna look back at the why isn't this you can say it was due the 20th. Yeah, due the 20th of February. Right, so based on when it was given, you would have a month. So I think you're gone one week already. I don't know. I'm not doing anything. Great. Mm, when great. said that she, you know, read up a little bit, which is good. So why am I not seeing it? Assignment one. Okay, here it is. So let me. Uh, all right. Here we go. So the the same phrase that we heard, you know, being discussed in the video just now, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. It says using any territory with which you are familiar outside of Jamaica, discuss the well-established view in the sociology of language that the status of a particular variety in a given society may be more the result of extra linguistic factors such as social, cultural, and political than linguistic ones. When we talk about status, or for some of you, you say status, that's another um, variable, right? So my, my nephews correct me and they say, auntie, it's not status, it's status. Anyway, so I guess that's one, according to age, right? But the, the status now could be that it, it is seen as prestigious or it is seen as stigmatized or it's seen as an official language or a national language. So we're looking at, and for, for the prestige versus stigma, this has to do with language attitudes, right? The attitudes prescribed to the various languages and their speakers. So it's the users of the language who would determine if there is prestige or if there is stigma attached, right? And if there is stigma attached, then that language or that, let me call it a code. So a code is a neutral term that we use when we're discussing dialect versus language. So that code, if it is seen as stigmatized, would not be considered as an official language, for instance, right? Because of language attitudes. So the extra linguistic factors, if it's social, we're talking about language attitudes, right? If it's cultural, we're talking about, let's say, the use of the language and the domains in which it is concentrated. And of course, political, as Kaivan was saying, if there is no political backing, if there is no political will for the language to be used in public formal domains, then this, this dialect or this variety will remain a, var a variety of a language. They will just consider it to be a dialect. So really what the statement is saying is that there is no real difference between a language and a dialect, excepting that the language, what we call a language, has social, cultural, political backing or support. And so it may be seen or declared as a language versus a dialect, no. 
not having supporters, not having anyone advocating for it to be used as an official language, for instance. And so it remains a dialect in the eyes of the, 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 the citizens, right? So there is no real difference in linguistics. There is no difference in terms of the linguistic components of a dialect versus a language. We call a dialect a variety of a language, right? That's all it is. It is a variety. So just as how you have received pronunciation, which is the British English, you have Standard American English, you have African American English, Standard Jamaican English, these Englishes, if I can say that, are dialects of British English, right? But that doesn't mean that Standard American English is not or is lacking in linguistic properties. Now, of course, you will have the British who will frown upon some of the, 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 the terms used in Standard American English because there are differences, right? But that doesn't mean that British English is necessarily better than Standard American English or that Standard American English is better than Standard Jamaican English. They are varieties of British English. However, the problem is when you don't have an official recognition of the speech of the group, people will tend to call it a dialect. So you hear people calling Jamaican Creole a dialect, and it's not a dialect. And, and a dialect is also, they, they also create this genre called a dialect, right? With the JCBC where they say, oh, dialect is poetry in Jamaica. There's, there's no such thing, not no what's up, right? That is just a social construct with no linguistic properties or evidence. Right? Because just as how English has a system in terms of its phonology, its syntax, etc., Jamaican Creole, Haitian Creole, they, they too have systems. So essentially what we're looking at is the fact that social factors, cultural, political, etc., these extra linguistic factors, these are what affect the these are what affect the um the status of a language. All right, I'm seeing a hand. Go ahead. Yes, Chris. Uh, um, yes, Doctor. Uh, question: Is this document available on Google Classroom? I don't think so. I think I said I was going to share it and put it in the WhatsApp group as well. Please do, please do. Right. Please do, please do, please do. So once you get the document, just please go through. And what you have to do is to find a speech community where there is some, some language that is seen as substandard and then to analyze why it is seen as such. Why is it not an official language, for instance? And that is why I said outside of Jamaica, because you know, once we think of something like that, we're gonna think of Jamaica. Right? But there are other areas within the region that you can use, or even in Hawaii, you know, not saying that you must go around and use Hawaii now, but they call it Pidgin, they call it Pidgin English, right? And it's not a pidgin, it's, it's, it's a language, right? It's, it's a language. So when we look at Creole languages too, we will see the distinction between a Creole versus a pidgin. And these are all languages, we speak them. The only difference with the pidgin and the Creole is that the pidgin, nobody learns the pidgin as their vernacular. So nobody learns the pidgin as their mother tongue but the creole once you have children learning the pidgin as their mother tongue it becomes a creole right and a pidgin is created out of a language contact situation so let's say on the plantation you have a pidgin being created 
once you have the next generation growing up to learn that pidgin, it is now considered a Creole language and that pidgin is P-I-D-G-I-N. All right? Yes. Janice. Um, question. We were supposed to find languages that aren't standard already? So, all right. Good question. So you can choose the approach that you want. You can choose a language that, you know, was made standard, was declared an official language, etc., and show that journey, show that it is because of extra linguistic factors, why it is now enjoying the status of an official standardized language. Or you can show, you can choose a, a, a dialect that is not yet considered to be a language and to show the extra linguistic factors that are preventing it from being named a language. So the approach is up to you. And the approach is also based on the, the territory that you are looking at. Okay, so Miss, I understand. Thank you. Right. So you. You might want to look at a triumphant situation where you know the, the, this dialect or this Creole struggled to become an official language, and you know what were the extra linguistic factors that contributed to that Creole moving from just a Creole to an official language. Or you may want to look at a Creole language now that really the, the, the advocates, they're advocating for it to be named an official language, but there are extra linguistic factors that are preventing it, that are blocking it. Or you might not want to look at a Creole at all and you want to look you know, somewhere else in, in Africa, you know, Australia, etc. All right. So it's really up to you to do your research, do your readings, and then choose accordingly. So Miss you're saying that uh, choose a country for which in which there is a language spoken there that is not official. And the reasons for the reasons for that. Or you may choose a language that is official and look mm -hmm. at why it was, you know, named as such based on extra. Okay. Language. So it's really okay. Up to you. Yes. Okay. I see. Right. Okay. You either look at why a language is not official or a country that is now speaking an official language mm -hmm. and the circumstances that led to their being yeah, in that status. Correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. It's clear and all. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right. Explain. Could you explain the bulleted points again? It's a status, prestigious, stigmatized, official language, national language. Right. Um, it wasn't in the original question, you know. So I just put it in there to assist you guys in terms oh, of... Oh, so you want one of these to come out in the paper? Right. So let's say if you talk about the status being an official language, naturally, there is some prestige that would be attached. Yes. Right. So they are linked. So you have to okay. make a link there. So we're looking at with prestige and stigma, we're looking at the status that people would attach to the language, right? With prestige and stigma. And with the official versus the national status, that is what the government ascribes to the language. You understand? So Right, so the prestige and stigma would be what people ascribe to the language, right? And official versus national language status would be what the government ascribes. So the people can't get up and say X dialect is now 
an official language. That is what the government does. So prestige and stigma, these are based on what the people say about the language, how they feel about the language, and what they do with the language and official versus national language status that now has to do with what the government does and of course you may see overlaps all right so you you may see where a national language is prestige in one domain versus another so for instance our discussion on jamaican creole we said that with with Jamaican Creole within a male setting, so a, a male dominated setting, you will find that Jamaican Creole enjoys status within that subculture, within that setting. So it's called covert prestige, right? However, on the national level, it is not given that recognition. Right? Outside of that space, it is still stigmatized in many places. Okay, so it's really dependent on the situation itself and the territory that you choose to look at. So what I'm going to ask is that once you read over the, the information, that you send me the territory that you're thinking of using and the languages that you're, you're thinking of just so i can give you some feedback all right okay don't, so don't send me any essays or paragraphs etc i just want to know the territory and the languages that you're going to use and then i can say yes you know and and perhaps to ask you your approach okay so what I'm going to do then is to take some time on Wednesday to do that with you guys. All right? Okay. Yes, and I'll do it individually. So what I'll do is if I am speaking with Kaivon, the rest of you, you will be in the waiting room. And then when I'm through with him, then I will admit somebody else, etc. All right? Okay, understood. Okay, great. All right, so if you have any other questions, you can let me know and I will respond to them. Katie and Walters, Yui at gmail.com or you can send a WhatsApp message. Okay, guys? Um, get on the WhatsApp. All right, no problem. Could you send the WhatsApp number? Oh, you're not in the group. So the, the WhatsApp link, if you're in the group, you will see the admin. I'm the admin, so you just send it to me. If you're not in the group, access the page in the Google Classroom, you would see the post with the WhatsApp link. All right, okay. once you click on it, you will automatically join the group. Okay. Yes. Okay, so see you guys on Wednesday. Okay, Miss, that, Miss, remember to send the, I don't have it either, the assignment. You're going to send it in the WhatsApp group, you said? And on the, the, the classroom page as oh. well. Okay. So I'll put them in right. I'll put them in both. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Bye everyone. See you on Wednesday. Bye, Miss. All right. Oh, I'm just seeing the private messages. Okay. So right. So Marlon, just send me. You are in the WhatsApp group, right? I don't think so. Oh, you were the person. Okay. So right. So just access the 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 link via the Google Classroom and then you can send me a message from there. All right. Alrighty.